arrows on the medium sized guys. External oblique muscle, and you gotta write out external oblique muscle. External obliques doesn't count as an S. Right. External oblique muscle, rectus abdominis in green, internal oblique muscle in yellow. Again, there are three different layers on the sides. This is the outer, this is the middle. And we can see that here if I take the chest plates off the half size guys and take a picture from the inside. Here you can see the inner layer and the red arrows pointing to this inner layer we call the transverse abdominis. Get it, over accentuate the last vowel. Transverse abdominis. And if you look at the edges of this chest plate, you can see the crease lines. On this side, you can see two crease lines. Because the right side is a superficial side, it has all three layers. Transverse abdominis in red, internal oblique muscle, which I said was the middle one in yellow, and the external oblique muscle in blue. On the left side, the blue the superficial layer has been peeled off. That's why there's only two layers on the side. Can you see the one crease line? Inner and the middle is all that's left on the deep side. Does this help? So it, there would be a blue arrow there? We can't quite see that. What's that? There would be a blue arrow at the end on the if left. There was a layer, but it's peeled off. There is no glue on this end. Look at it over there. It's not a bit of yellow. Okay. Yeah. Because this is off the screen. So it's 22 and 21. Okay. Everybody understand this? Then 22. I actually added this. This is one of the more recent pictures I added to the muscle PowerPoint because people weren't getting it. And I figured if I show the crease lines, they'll get it. All three layers on the superficial side, only the middle and inner on this side. And you can't even see it on that screen, so you can see it on this. Oh, there it is. Okay. You know how thick this is? I would say, if you're a couch potato, all three layers is about this thick. All you gotta do is cut open a cadaver and you can see it. If you are, Doing cardio three to five times a week, it might be that thick. <coughs> but if you're a couch potato, yeah, maybe this. That's it. It's paper thin. You use these muscles to breathe out and force expiration. So if you're working out, running or on the treadmill, every breath out, they're <laughs> squeezing the abdomen, it's pushing up the diaphragm. <laughs> Since they're so thin, they're not built for stamina. And if you are not in shape, you ask those things to contract every breath out, you assume they're cramping. Since they're on the side, that's why you get a side ache. Because they're so thin. Everybody got it? All right, now we're on the arm. It says upper arm, but you should know that it's just arm, breaking. This is obviously the anterior, because serratus anterior is pointing to the anterior. So the anterior arm, we're gonna have the biceps brachii. On the posterior side, we're gonna have the triceps brachii. And since it's listed, you've got to identify the three heads. This right here on the bottom is the lateral head triceps brachii. The one up on top is the long head triceps brachii. This is the large right arms right here and in the back over there. And I only, we only got three in the whole room. So I got two on this side and one on this side, right in the middle, large right arm. I laid it on its side so it's like this, right arm just like that, posterior side. Remember the radius goes to the Thumb. Thumb. So up on top is the radial side, on the bottom is the ulnar side. Radius is lateral. Now watch. 
This model shows the crease lines between the three heads. Everybody got it? Those are the two crease lines between the three heads. Everybody see where those lines are? Mm -hmm. Lateral head, long head, and what you should write next to medial head is it's the smallest. Everybody got it? The word for head is sept. It's triceps. Be sure to include that S at the end of triceps. You must say brachia. And then you have to identify the head because it's listed on page 16. Any questions? Turn to page 18. This is muscle number three. It has a lot of origins because each head has an origin. You don't have to identify which head goes to which spot but that's why there's a lot listed under origins. Below the glenoid cavity, superior medial humerus, and posterior humerus. Those are the three heads. Everybody got it? They all converge on the olecranon, and because of the trochlea, it only has one action, and that is extending the forearm. I will allow you to say extending the elbow, because that's what's happening at the elbow. Extension, increasing joint angle. All right, so again, same thing here. This is the large right arms, lateral head on the bottom, long head up on top. On the anterior side is the biceps brachii. This is actually was seen in lecture this morning when we were doing agonist, synergist, antagonist. In case of flexing the forearm, Biceps brachii is the agonist. It sits on top of a flat muscle, brachialis. This is the synergist. And these guys are the antagonists. Same thing as we saw this morning in lecture. Okay? Can you repeat the green and yellow? Biceps brachii. Okay. Yellow is brachialis. You have to say brachii. Cannot just say biceps. Look on the right column under thigh. You see how we section the thigh into three sections, hamstrings, quadriceps, adductors? I'm gonna cover this next week. But what is the first muscle listed under hamstrings? Biceps femoris. That's why you have to say biceps brachia. Yes? Yes. Yes, you do. I'll show you how to do this really easy. Okay. This on the left is the lateral head of the triceps brachii. On the right is the long head. Biceps brachii in green, sitting on a flat muscle in yellow brachialis. Green is biceps brachii. Yellow is brachialis. Again, it's going to be these colors for a while. All right, here's a biceps brachii, and you can see the two heads here, can't you? The key here for identifying the heads of the biceps brachii is match up the L's. Match up the L's. If this is a left arm, it's like this. And the head that is lateral is the long head. Match up the L's. The head that is lateral is the long head. Match up the L's. The head that is lateral is the long head. Match up the L's. Do I have to say it again? Do you see why I get so sick here in my voice? I'm repeating the same damn thing 15 times. So, if this is a left arm and the thumb is lateral, that means this arrow is the long head because it's lateral. This one's medial, it's the short head. Match up the L's. The lateral one is the long head. It sits on a flat muscle. So flat you can see it on both sides of the biceps brachii. Brachialis. Brachialis is flat. 
display, you can see it on both sides of the biceps brachii. Biceps brachii, same left arm, so this is the long head. This is the short head. And it's sitting on top of the brachialis. All right. Let's turn to page 18. This is muscle number four. Is this helpful for you for me to go over this? Yes. Okay, because I'm getting really tired and I would really like you guys to break up in groups and teach yourselves. But I guess you want me to do this. All right, long head originates above the glenoid, short head originates on the coracoid process. Again, just save both. You don't have to identify which head goes to which. They converge onto the radial tuberosity. Now, two weeks ago, I said this about the radial tuberosity. It is on the anterior side. That's why when you pull, you do biceps curls, right? But I said it also has a medial inclination. And when, if you've got a process with a medial inclination going like that, and you pull it up like this, you do this. And that's a mild supination. What does it say for the action of the biceps brachii? Supinates forearm flexes. Flexes supinates the forearm. Any questions? Then also listed under the upper arm is brachioradialis. It really should be listed on the forearm because only the origin is in the arm. The bulk of this muscle is in the forearm. Here I'm going to show you some soft tissue landmarks that you should eventually learn depending on which field of healthcare you go to. There is a diamond shaped soft tissue cup right here. So even though we use the word fossa for a cup shaped depression in bone, it's actually also used in soft tissue. And there's a diamond shaped soft tissue cup right in the crook of your elbow. That's called the cubital fossa. And that's why I put in dark ink right here. That's not a bad drawing, isn't it? No, it's pretty good. I can't believe how much care I put in this. All right, thumb is lateral. So this is a uh, long head. Biceps, remember the S. And the medial one is the short head. Touch up the L's. But bordering on the lateral side, the cubital fossa, so bordering the lateral side of the cubital fossa because this thumb is lateral, pinky is medial, is the brachial radialis. Radialis. And that's this one. So this is the left hand. This is the left arm. What I'm drawing on the board is the right arm. You don't have to write right arm, man. You can, you can identify this as a right arm. Yeah. Same color arrows here. Brachialis is underneath the biceps brachial. You can see the diamond shaped cubital fossa here. Boom, 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 boom. Everybody see that? <laughs> All right, this is the right arm. This is the reason why I did this, because a lot of these arrows are on the big right arm right here, so it's like this. Everybody got it? So that means this is lateral, this is the long head, this is the short head. Sitting on top of brachialis, you can see it on both sides because it's flat. That's the yellow arrow. And there's the brachioradialis, again, bordering the cubital fossa on the lateral side.
There's the brachioradialis there again. It's on the thumb side. But it's lateral. All right. Uh, I'm going to erase this. Everybody know our, our rule for spelling muscles? Everybody got that? Okay. If you look at this picture of the forearm, all the forearm muscles look identical. They're nothing but straps. Everybody see that? I'm going to show you how to be systematic with the forearm. Are you ready? But before I do that, let me uh, write some rules here that if you get this down, doing these muscles actually is quite easy. So if we're talking about the forearm hand, I'm going to do another one next week on the leg and the foot. A lot of these, instead of identifying a shroud, you got to pay attention to the insertion, the muscle insertion. Okay? <clears throat> if it inserts, okay, anatomical position. If it inserts on the posterior side of the fingers or the hand and it shortens, it's going to do this. What motion is this from here to here? That's extension. So if it inserts on the posterior, those are going to be extensors doing extension. If it inserts on the anterior, it's going to curl the fingers. If it's inserting on this side, and it pulls, it's going to do this. Obviously, that's flexion, correct? Increasing joint angle or decreasing joint angle is flexion. So if it's on the anterior, those are flexors. If it inserts on the lateral, It's going to do this if you pull on the lateral. What's that? From here to here. Abduction. And it inserts on the medial. It's going to pull them in. What is this? Adduction. inserts on the fingers, or let's go on the thumb first, because that's the pollux, pollicis, if it inserts on the regular fingers, digitoro, then if Two muscles, and this is only true in the forearm hand, do the same thing. If the belly is in the hand itself, we use the term brevis. If it's way up in the forearm, the tendon's going to be longer. So we use the word longus. Now you have that down, a lot of this is going to be easy. Much easier than trying to identify same looking straps. Everybody got it? All right, so obviously these are inserting on the back side of the fingers. These are obviously extensors. Everybody see that, recognize that with the blue arrows? Inserting on the back side of the fingers or the hand. I have two dark blue arrows because the bottom one is showing you the landmark. If you were on the posterior side of the forearm, find this first, regardless of what I picked. Find this first. 
And the landmark on the posterior side of the forearm is a communal tendon there in white that splits into three. And you see the communal tendon there in white is the bottom dark blue arrow that splits into three. Yes. The old name for this muscle was extensor digitorum communis for the communal tendon. Well, they have since dropped the third word. And now none of the words end with S. So up there at the very top, the dark blue arrow is extensor digitorum muscle. You don't have the communist word anymore, but that, it's too bad because it would remind you the landmark you're looking for in the posterior forearm is the communal tendon that splits into three. Man, if you're not writing that down, you are wasting a gold nugget that other people in open lab would love to have. Posterior forearm, you're looking for the communal tendon that splits into three. Extensor digitorum muscle. This is the landmark. That is the muscle. Extensor digitorum muscle. Because once you have the landmark, you just got to remember that the lateral, the radius is lateral since it goes to the thumb, the ulnar is medial, goes to the pinky. Then you know that this guy that is on the pinky side of this landmark muscle is the extensor carpi ulnaris. It's easy once you find the landmark muscle. Just go to the pinky side. And on the pinky side is the ulna. On the thumb side is the radius. Radius goes to the thumb. Well, I'm going to the pinky side of the landmark muscle. This is extensor carpi ulnaris. Everybody see how to do that? The way your fingers are controlled is number one, where the muscles insert on the fingers but also the direction of the tendon pull. And the thing that is keeping the tendon pull direction correct is the retinaculum. And that's the orange, orange arrow. You just need one word, retinaculum. It's not a muscle, it's white. So don't write muscle. I suppose you can write ligament, but you don't need it. Just write retinaculum. Everybody got these? Same color arrows here. This is brachioradialis, it's on the thumb side. Here's a landmark muscle because the communal tendon splits into three. Extensor digitorum muscle on the pinky side of that is extensor carpi ulnaris in light blue. Any questions? This is on the anterior side. These are the large right arms. And so this is where I can fill out the rest of this. This is brachioradialis. It's on the thumb side of the cubital fossa. Brachioradialis. In yellow, on the medial side, of the cubital fossa, is the pronator teres. And then just on the other side of the pronator teres are uh, all the flexors. And those are all the flexors there with blue arrows that you see up there. Does this kind of help with this figure right there? Cubital fossa is a good landmark to go from. Lateral side, it's brachioradialis. Medial side, it's pronator teres. On the other side of the small pronator teres are all the flexors. Everybody got it?
all the flexors are coming from off of, they originate off the medial epicondyle, which is why if you're playing a lot of tennis and you're doing this, it can get inflamed, tennis elbow, medial epicondylitis. It's all originating from it. All right, here's what you wanna do on the anterior forearm. Again, this is gold. If you don't think you need it, don't listen. The landmark is finding the long tendon that's going to the palm. The long tendon going to the palm, which ends up here, and this gray thing called the palmar aponeurosis. In the large right arms, they cut it off right here. And if you look able to see the palm, you can see how that long tendon just cuts off right there instead of fanning out into this gray thing. But this long tendon going to the palm is the dark blue landmark on the anterior side. And what do you think that muscle is called with the long tendon going to the palm? Palmaris. Palmaris longus. Find that first. Regardless of what I pin, find that first. Then, okay, again, this is the right arm. The belly that's just to the thumb side of that is flexor carpi radialis, and the one on the pinky side is flexor carpi ulnaris. It's easy if you start systematically with the landmark. Oh, this looks better. You can actually see much better how they cut off the long tendon going to the palm. This is palmaris longus right there. Do that first. Long tendon that's cut off right there, going to the palm, palmaris longus. Go on the thumb side, flexor carpi radialis. Go on the pinky side, flexor carpi ulnaris. Otherwise, you're just looking at identical looking straps, aren't they, aren't you? All these muscles look like straps. They all look the same. Look at this down here. Boom, 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 boom. You gotta find a way of discriminating the content. And you do that by finding the landmark first. Are we clear? Any questions? And that's just showing you the long tendon going to the palm. So that's the landmark. Boom, palmaris longus. Pronated teres is down there in yellow. Even the little guys with the arm up, you can see the palmaris longus of the long tendon going to that gray area. Palmar aponeurosis. And then it says, what's on either side? Thumb side, flexor carpi radialis. Pinky side, flexor carpi ulnaris. Okay. I want to. Get, I'm going to get all the way through rotator cuff. So we're going to finish the left column. We're going to do the first two sections on the right column. This is palmaris longus. This thing actually dropped. This is supposed to go to this. So this is supposed to go to that. Don't worry about it. That's palmaris longus. All right. Look at this yellow one. And then look at the middle of the whiteboard. This muscle inserts on the lateral thumb. There are two muscles that will do this same thing. This belly is in the hand. What is the name of the yellow muscle? Abductor, because it's lateral. Pollicis, because it's the thumb. Brevis, because there are two muscles that do the same thing, and this belly is in the hand. This is the meaty part at the base of your thumb. Abductor, pollicis, brevis. It's in the hand. Everybody see how the names work? This is too much content for you. This is the time to get your brains up to speed to handle this level of content. It does not get easier. It does not get less. I will tell you right now, last semester in spring, I had one of the strongest physiology classes I've ever had. 53 students passed, 10 with A's. This semester I have one of the weakest. You think I'm gonna lower the standards? 
every semester it's got to be equivalent. I will flunk half of them if they do not rise up. And I will tell you most of those students were not in my anatomy class. They got passing grades when they should have gotten it because their brains are not ready for the level of content in physiology. I need to get your brains up to snuff, which means you look tired, you look like you don't care, and I want to say tough shit. Kick yourself in the ass and get up to snuff. It's not up to me to get you up to snuff. It's up to you. And if you don't care, do something else. Okay? Abductor, pollicis brevis. In the hand. Abductor, pollicis brevis. That's this model right here. In the hand. Abductor, pollicis brevis. Is in the hand. I took off the aphrodurosis. Now I'm going to take off some of those tendons. These are the tendons, by the way, that go through the carpal tunnel, which is right here. And these all have tendon sheets, those tubular bursa. They're all, each one of them has them. That we talked about in lecture today. But here we can see now one muscle that is inserting on the medial thumb. And it's the only muscle that inserts on the medial thumb. What is the name of that muscle? Adductor pollicis. Adductor pollicis. That's a green one. See, how, once you have this, how easy this is? I'm going to take off all these tendons, and now you can see the whole thing. Same color arrows. Notice how the textbook's definition of origin and insertion doesn't work. Here's the origin. Here's the insertion. It's equally distal proximal. You can't tell which one is more proximal than the other. But when it contracts, when it shortens, this doesn't move, this moves, it pulls the thumb in. This is the insertion. Same color arrows here on the large right arms. Then let's add this orange one. This inserts on the lateral thumb. What is the name of this muscle? Abductor pollicis longus. Abductor pollicis longus. Lateral thumb, abductor pollicis. The belly is in the forearm because it's proximal to the retinaculum. And up at the top, you see just a little bit of the adductor pollicis. It's actually the webbing in between your thumb and the rest of your hand. That's the adductor pollicis. Same color arrows there. Everybody got it? Same adductor pollicis longus. Everybody got it? All right, now we're done with the right. Column. Let's go to the top of the left. The landmark muscle of the upper back is the trapezius muscle. It's huge. Trapezius muscle. It's huge. Other mammals that walk on all fours actually have multiple trapezius muscles. Like the cat, I think, has four trapezius muscles. They only have one, but we can contract just parts of it at a time. We don't have to contract the whole thing. It has a huge origin, starting with the occipital bone, neck ligaments, and the spine of the thoracic vertebra. Huge origin. Then there's the deltoidus there in green. Trapezius, deltoidus. Everybody see that? Trapezius deltoidus. Now let's look at this before we go to page 18. Notice the trapezius here in yellow ends at this bony horseshoe that goes from clavicle to acromion to the spine of the scapula. Clavicle, this is the acromial end. Acromion, spine of the scapula. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. It's like a big bony horseshoe. Everybody see that? Notice. The trapezius ends 
on the same bony horseshoe that the deltoideus begins. Does everybody see that? Okay, let's go to page 18. Number five, trapezius. There's that long origin, occipital, neck ligaments, thoracic vertebrae. Insertion is the bony horseshoe, clavicle, acromion, spinal, and scapula. Everybody see that? Now, pretend this is a digital page, and you're going to take your mouse and you're going to highlight that insertion, clavicle, acromion, spinal, and scapula. You're going to right click at the copy, and then you're going to go into the origin of the deltoideus. It's the same bony horseshoe, clavicle, acromion, spinal, and scapula. Do you see how it's just copied? It's the same bony horseshoe. Or one muscle ends, the other begins. At the same bony horseshoe. That's why trapezius insertion is identical to deltoideus origin. Everybody got it? Yeah. The deltoideus inserts, it all converges on the deltoid tuberosity. And if you shorten the deltoid, it's just going to do this. Because the deltoid tuberosity is the lateral diaphysis. And that's abducting the humerus. Everybody got it? Any questions? Pay attention to this. Because we can contract parts of the trapezius, its origins and insertions are actually quite complicated. For example, when I did this example in lecture about a class one Libra doing this, you guys remember that? Mm -hmm. The trapezius is the muscle doing it, but at that mo movement, the occipital is the insertion. Where is it listed on page 18? Under origin. Now what are you going to do? Yeah, you guys don't know. You're hoping I tell you. I'm not going to ask action of the trapezius. We'll just go with the anatomy here. I'm not going to ask the action of the trapezius. We will go with the anatomical origins and insertions that I just pointed out, and we'll leave it at that. And we'll leave out the complications of the fact that you can contract parts of the trapezius. And when you do contract parts of the trapezius, you change origins and insertions. We're going to just leave that out. I'm not going to ask actions of the trapezius. If I ask trapezius, it's just going to be origin and insertion. Are we clear? Yes. yes. All right, we're almost done. Here's the same trapezius and deltoideus. But on the half size models, you can see the trapezius is pulled off the deep side. And now we can see levator scapula muscle there in uh, purple. What does the E at the end mean? Plural, because you got one on the left, this, this one on the left here on this purple arrow. You also have one on the right. How many can I pin with one pin? One. one. Cross off the E. It's levator scapula muscle. You got two rhomboid shaped muscles. This one's small, this one's large. So the orange arrow is rhomboidius minor. It's not about position, it's about size. And the lilac arrow is on rhomboidius major. The serratus posterior superior is underneath those. And all the models, you can't take off the rhomboid muscles. Red arrow is the teres major. Teres major. Okay, now look carefully at the top of page 16, right there where it says teres major. And notice the dashed line. Is everybody looking at that? Mm -hmm. Teres major is above the dashed line, which means teres major is not part of the rotator cuff. Okay, starts with teres minor. And you'll see here why. But the teres major, you can see it originates from the lowest point in the scapula, as far down as you can. It goes through the armpit and it inserts on the left tubercle. So if you start out here and you pull on the teres major, it's going to do this. But since it's pulling behind through the armpit, 
on the lesser tubercle, and it shortens it, can also do this. It really rotates. What does it say on the page? Teres major, inferior scapula, lesser tubercle, adducts, medially rotates the humerus. And that's it for page 18 for today. We will return next week. Everybody got that? Any questions? Those are both uh, trapezes. Both the top and the bottom, bright yellow arrows is trapezes. Anybody else? Green is deltoides. Anybody else? The orange and the light purple. Those are the rhomboid muscles. Orange is rhomboidus minor, small. The lilac arrow is rhomboidus major. Anybody else? Yes. The purple one is levator scapula muscle. Anybody else? Shall I just redo this whole slide? <laughs> <laughs> Please. Can you just point to all of them and say it one more time? <laughs> okay. Bright yellow is trapezius. Green is deltoideus. Mm -hmm. Then the ring around the rosy. Levator scapula muscle. Rhomboideus minor. Rhomboideus major. Carries major. You want me to do it again? <laughs> no. Okay, we good? Now we're going to finish up with the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff is four muscles that form a ring of insertion around the head of the humerus. Remember, I brought this up two weeks ago when we were talking about how we do, do the skeleton first and all the fossa, all the fossa on the scapula. But let's say this is lateral view of the head of the left humerus. So if this is the lateral view of the left humerus, then this is anterior, and this is posterior. If I have to tell you what is inferior and superior, you are really tired. Okay. Same color arrows. Everybody got trapezius, deltoideus? This is just a close-up of the previous slide. Same color arrows. Now let's take off the deltoideus and we can start seeing the rotator cuff. Okay, same color arrows. Levator scapula on top, the two rhomboid muscles, teres major and red. You can see how teres major is not part of the rotator cuff because this is the head of the humerus. Only these muscles are rotator cuff muscles. Teres major is not. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, the most inferior of the rotator cuff muscles is the teres minor. That's the green. Terry's minor. That's part of the rotator cuff. Up on top, originating from the supraspinous fossa, is supraspinatus. It's the most superior of the rotator cuff muscles. And you can see the spine of the scapula, so you know that's supraspinatus, from above the spine. I don't have light for you. No. And we'll use purple. 
This looks like three muscles. It's actually the same muscle, and you can see that it's below this, coming from below the spine of the scapula, from the infraspinous fossa. The most posterior muscle is <coughs> infraspinatus. Uh, next week in lecture, I'll talk about multipennate muscles. The deltoideus is a multipennate muscle, so is infraspinatus. That's why it looks like multiple muscles. It's the same one muscle. Everybody got it? Deltoideus there in green, but here in yellow, this is the anterior side, so this is the subscapular fossa, and coming from the subscapular fossa, subscapularis. That's the most anterior. And then you form a complete ring of attachments around the head of the humerus. This is the large right arms again. Terry's major completely bypassing the head of the humerus right here. But there's teres minor in green. It is going to the head of the humerus. Then you see the manufacturer wrote three number twos because it's the same muscle, infraspinatus, it's multipennate, so it looks like multiple muscles, it's the same muscle, infraspinatus. The yellow is not uh, supraspinatus, it is the trapezius that normally covers it. You can see supraspinatus only can peel away trapezius, and then this model of trapezius is still there. Any questions? Minor. Any other questions? So we've covered two thirds of lab exam two material today. So after the lab exam next week, uh, we will have to cover one third. Does that sound good? Yes. All right, you want to talk about lab exam one before I release you? Yes. Of course you do. Okay, uh, those that are LAP students with time extensions, please email me, remind me, I have to show up early. Um, because I have to wait for Alicia to get done with zoology, I may be setting up stations while you're starting on the exam because it's just, uh, I don't have that much time. Uh, but everyone else, you want to be outside that door at 12.55 when it opens. You want to be here. That one will be remain locked next week. Only that one's open. You come in, you get your, uh, lab form, and everyone should get a clipboard because you're going to be walking around. Write your name on it, fold it just like you did the lab quiz where you cover everything but your name. And now look at the whiteboard and watch me. Station one will be here. Two, three, four, five, right next to the sink. I got to double back down here a little bit to go to six. Look at the whiteboard. Seven. Eight, nine, ten, eleven. Please don't go to the extra credit from here. What comes after eleven? Twelve. Twelve. You go into here. Thirteen. Now, when you get your four, you're going to put your stuff underneath the desk on the plank. Please do not block any walkways on the plank. Otherwise, you're going to trip somebody. Then you're going to get in front of a station, okay? And if I get in front of this station, what station am I standing in front of? 16. 16. So what I do is I go on my form and I circle 16. And that circle is going to remind me when we start, I'm starting to write my answers on line 16. Because only one student can start writing on line one. And that student is the student that starts at this station. No one else is starting writing answers on line one. That's why you want to first 
determine which is your starting station, circle that number, and start writing answers there. Everybody got it? Mm -hmm. What if I'm standing right here? What station am I on? 20. How about here? 23. 24, 25. When you're done with 25, you have to turn your exam form on the back because on the back are the extra credit lines and you're gonna to come to the front. Extra credit one, two, three, four, and that's missing five. As soon as you're done with extra credit five, don't stand here. Start the long walk now. We have 60 seconds per station. You have to answer A and B if you're done early there. Wait right here, because I'm gonna say five seconds and shift. Everybody got it? Yeah. When I say shift, now you've got two steps. Boom, you're on station one. You gotta turn the form back to the front. I don't wanna see anybody sprinting from the other side of the room. <laughs> That's why you wanna do the walk early. You just wait here for five seconds and shift, two steps. Everybody got it? But there are A and B questions per station. You've got 60 seconds per station and 55 seconds. I give you a warning. Five seconds and shift. This is for stations 1 through 25. When you get to the extra credit, turn it to the back. Everybody got it? Mm -hmm. When you're done with that and you're doing the long walk, flip it back over until you're to station 1. Is this, everybody got it? Yeah. You want to keep A answers to A questions in the A column. That means don't switch them. You got it? If you switch them and they're completely right and spelled correctly, this lab exam and this lab exam only, I will give you half credit. After this, I don't care if they're right and spelled correctly. If they're switched, you get zero. Are we clear? Why am I being so hard ass about it? Because this is healthcare. You know what you do when we talk about rotator cuff? You know what they do if you got rotator cuff surgery? While well, they're prepping you? They're not gonna use these. They're gonna use a Sharpie that's gonna stay on your body for at least a week. And they're gonna draw on your skin and they say, cut here. And on this side they say, X, not here. Because they don't wanna switch A and B. They switch A and B and they're gonna get sued. You switch A and B, you get half credit for this lab exam. You switch after this lab exam, you get no credit. Keep A answers to A questions and they call. If you wanna ask clarification questions, ask them early in the 60 second cycle. If it's getting close to shifting, I'm gonna say hold it off to the 10 minute second look period. So how long is it gonna take us to rotate? Not just an Asian thing. <laughs> it's going to take 30 minutes, right? 25 stations, five extra credit stations. 30 minutes. After 30 minutes, there'll be a 10 minute second look period. The only thing here is since we got, we have 32. It's going to take us 32 minutes. Or if everybody shows up next week, I'm going to have a sit still station right here. And probably over there by that sink, I'm gonna have a sit still station. Where you're done with station number five, you got a minute where you just gotta stand off to the side. And then after the next minute, five seconds of shift, then you go to six. Everybody got it? Because there are only 30 stations and I got 32 students. So there'll be two standby stations. You gotta just chill before you can continue rotating. Are we clear? So after 32 minutes, we'll have a 10 minute second period. The only rule here is one student per station. So, especially when we're crowded, please be considerate, all right? If you know there's three or four students standing behind you, don't just sit there hovering and bogarting the station. See what you need to see, move so other people can see what they need to see. Are we clear? Then when you're done, there's no set time. If you're done any time during the 10 minute second look period, bring your exam to the front. Walk over there, the bucket will be in that sink. Put your clipboard in the big bucket. 
and wait outside with your voices lowered because we can hear you talking about station 15. Are we clear? Wait outside and then when everyone's done, then we come back in and go over the end. Do you want kind of want to break down in the stations? You sure? Yes. You don't want to be surprised? No. The hell not? I actually gave some of this away already, didn't I? Yeah. One and two, microscopic phone structures. Those two models over there by these sinks will be stations one and two. Three and four will be long bone stations. Then C in green, we have five, six, seven, eight, nine, sometimes it's 10. Those are the only stations, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and maybe 10, I don't know which one I'm gonna use. <clears throat> where you can pick up the bone. These are appendicular bones. The A question is what bone is this from which side of the body? Left scapula, right only, whatever it is. The B question is did you listen to me when I said when you're studying on the bones, make sure you have an articulated skeleton around? Because you've got to know how this thing fits in the hole. The B question is what is the most distal landmark? <clears throat> what is the most proximal landmark? What structure of what bone does this articulate with on the proximal end or the distal end? Everybody got it? I can't have a pin on it because you're picking it up. These are the only stations you can touch. Every other station, do not touch it. You guys want to know why you can't touch it? I'm going to move it. Remember uh, I said that the days of the lottery are over? You are now competing against students in other sections and you're actually competing against students sitting next to you. Do you guys remember saying that? Mm -hmm. Well, this was always true for me when I was a student, and there were guys that we would call cutthroats. On an anatomy lab practical, they will go along, get the answer, then move the pin so everybody else gets it wrong. Wow. They were all kinds of cutthroats. You guys cannot touch anything with pins because of that. Are we clear? Okay. Then after nine, once you get to whether it's 10 or 11, again, you'll have big red letters. Do not touch this. On these stations, there'll be green letters. Go ahead and pick it up. Everything else, it'll have red letters. Do not touch this. After uh, you have those ones you can pick up, there will be 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, through. Uh, station 15 will be other appendicular bones with pins in it. What is the bony landmark for both A and B? Everybody got it? Then starting on 16, we'll start with the skull. There'll be several stations, around four stations with articulated skulls. Then two disarticulated skull bones. Then a station on sutures and fontanelles two stations on vertebrae, and station number 25 is going to be that knee model. That'll be station 25. The first four extra credit stations are going to have figures like, what is that, page 14 for the articulations? It's like page 14 except with just one pointer. One line. A question is what is the major functional classification? That's the capitalized word. B question, what is the subtype? That's the small case word. That's eight out of the 10 extra credit points. The last extra credit station will be a third disarticulated skull bone. I just, I just gave it away. I gave the farm away. As soon as we're done with that, we will go over the answers. I have to pick up all the pins, and then we have to clean it all up, and then I just got a third of lab exam two to cover. Any questions? Okay, well, I will stick around until the end of lab four.